Uh, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, I bring with me the greetings from uh, uh, Cooper's Edge uh, Church. They send their appreciation and greetings to you. Uh, I was there this morning, and uh, they're uh, uh, in as good heart as they can be, uh, but they're very thankful for the fellowship between the two churches. Uh, so please be encouraged uh, by that. Uh, today is Pentecost Sunday. Uh, around the world, uh, the Christian church remembers and rejoices in the fact that God, in his outrageous kindness, poured out his spirit uh, upon the church. And through that, the, the mission of God took another huge step forward as the, the message of Jesus Christ was proclaimed in the hearing of all kinds of people there in Jerusalem and then continued to spread. And so as we uh, give thanks for the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, we're going to sing. Uh, the, the, a chief ministry of God's Holy Spirit is to shine a spotlight on Jesus. And so our first hymn is, going, is called, My Hymn of Praise Shall Be Forever Jesus. As the music starts, we'll stand and sing.
Let's come to our great God and Savior in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you that through the work and in the merits of Jesus Christ, we can come to you and unashamedly acknowledge that you are our God, our rescuer, and our King. We thank you we can lift our praise to you now. Here in the midst of the the muck and the mire of life, we can come to you and praise you. And we thank you that we can do so in the anticipation that one day we will do so unstained by our sin and perfected in your power and glory. Lord, we pray uh, that you would receive our praise in the name of Christ, you would quicken our praise in the name of Christ, and you would cause us to be men and women, young and old, who know what it is to lift our hearts to you, not just in what we sing, but in how we live. Lord, we give you thanks for the gracious outpouring of your Holy Spirit all those years ago. We thank that you are utterly committed to the the spread of the message of Jesus Christ, the conversion of the lost, and the, the, the new creation that begins with Jesus and culminates when he returns. We pray, gracious God, that you would establish us in resting in our God and in confidence that you will accomplish all that you have set out to do. And may we trust you for every single day and every single step. Lord, receive our prayers and hear our prayers we ask. Amen. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to sing um, a hymn Uh, called, I Ask the Lord That I Might Grow. This is possibly one of the most unusual hymns uh, that I I choose for congregational singing. I don't choose it very often at all. It's written by a man called John Newton. And in in the hymn, he tells his story. It may not be your story, but it's his story. He tells his story. He asked God that he would grow uh, in faith and love and every grace, as he poetically puts it. What happens next then? Well, God answers in a very unusual way. He causes him to grow, but far differently to what he expected. Um, I need to explain to you, there's a a few words in verse 5. Can we we just have verse 5 up? You see the last line of verse 5? Blasted my gourds and laid me low. Anybody want to have a go at explaining that one? Um, When Jonah gave the message to Nineveh, and then expected God to, or wanted God rather, to judge Nineveh. He, he left the city to a high point to look out over it. And there was a hot day and God grac- graciously provided him a plant to provide him shelter. Gourd, that's what it's called in the old translation. But God also saw to it that a worm came and ate the plant so that it withered and died so that Jonah, uh, Noah was... Jonah, thank you. Noah was nowhere near the gourd, okay? Um, so, that, so that Jonah was exposed again, and it triggered anger in Jonah, and God was able to deal uh, with that. Blasted my gourd is a description of what God does to that plant, and it becomes a metaphor to false resting places, false refuges that we find. That's what it means. Does that make sense? I'm not sure why we still use those words, but we do. That's uh, that's the the reference. Um, So this may not be your story. It was certainly John's story, but it can often ring true with many Christians who find that actually God does things with his children that very often we don't expect. Hopefully, it'll be a help to you. Let's stand and sing.
Uh, just before I read uh, God's word uh, to us, uh, just a few notices uh, to say. Uh, there's a bring and share lunch next Sunday. That's a, there's a picnic, uh, and so, but you still need to put your name down uh, if you come into that just to help with the planning of things. So uh, you're very, very welcome to come to that. The idea of the bring and share meals is just, it's just time together. Uh, and we're just trying to secure that. So we're uh, building friendships, strengthening friendships, and making new ones as well. So we commend that uh, to you. We can't guarantee the weather will be like it was today, mind, but we'll see how we go. And then just uh, some people to pray for, Dot and Jeff Cully continue to need uh, our prayers, Dot. Just the tail end of this week was moved into a different ward. And just, just that prayer that really the, the medical staff would be given all the wisdom they would need to identify and to treat her as well as possible. I'm praying for Gerald and Mavis, continuing to pray for them as well. Um, and then can I ask you to pray for Doreen's sister-in-law, Samantha. She's been rushed into hospital this week. She's currently in intensive care, and there's just some questions as to what the best treatment is to give for her. So I promised the family I'd mention that today. So commit them to your prayers. Let's pray for these things, and then we'll read God's word. Father in heaven, as we've just sung, uh, helped by John Newton's hymn, we gladly confess that there are times where your, your providence and your wisdom just simply confuses us. And sometimes we don't know what it is that you're doing. But we are glad. We are glad that your wisdom is far beyond our wisdom. We're glad that your heart of mercy and compassion, your desire for us to know you and to follow you is far beyond what we would ever possibly wish for ourselves. And so we gladly bow our knees to you, the sovereign God, who can do with us whatever you choose to do. And we're glad that this sovereign will is gloriously twinned to your tender love. And we pray that as you do with us according to how you see fit, that you would, you would give us evidence time and time again of your tender love, of your wonderful patience, of your great desire for us to be gloriously united to you one day in the new creation, but yet steadily learning of you in these days until Christ returns or calls us home. So we pray for those that we know of, some by name and some by situation. We pray, gracious God, for those who continue to grieve and miss loved ones dearly. Gracious God, be their continued comfort and their fountain of peace in these difficult days. And we pray for those who are receiving medical treatment. We've named some for Dot and Gerald and Doreen's sister-in-law. We pray, gracious God, for your hand upon them. We pray for the family as they watch and wait and, and, hope, and plan for hopeful recovery. We, we ask that you give patience and we, get, we pray for the medical staff and all that they do. But we thank you for the wonderful gift of medical insight into medical conditions. And we pray that they would know success. And we pray, as we've been remembering at Pentecost Sunday, that you, by your spirit, would minister in a way that no human being can. You would minister by your spirit to those who are poorly or frail or frightened or face uncertain days that you would establish them in the faith. You would cause them to be strengthened in their appreciation of your love for them in these days. Thank you. We can trust you with every part of all of our days. Thank you. We can trust you, those that we know and love. We commit them to you. Lord, we thank you. We can trust you for the ongoing forgiveness of our sins. How gracious you are. We thank you we can trust you for the, the giving of our daily bread, how generous you are. And we thank you we can trust you for the protection from the evil one 
and deliverance in temptation. How mighty you are. Gracious God, receive our prayers and hear our praise we ask. Amen. I'm going to turn to Matthew chapter 13 for this evening. I think just because of the heat of, of the day, I'm just going to read the last section that's on the screen there. So uh, verses 1 to 9 and verses 18 to 23 is the parable of the sower. That's just really for backdra- background. I'm just going to read those three verses, 31, 32, and 33 out of Matthew uh, 13. Matthew 13, starting to read at verse at 31. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree, so the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. We'll stop there. We give thanks to God for, his re- uh, for the reading of his word, uh, for the teaching of Jesus Christ all those years ago, and we trust that will help us as we consider that uh, together. We're going to sing um, before we look at that passage uh, it's a hymn that it's a prayer asking God the Holy Spirit uh, to breathe uh, on us let's stand and sing together
Matthew 13, uh, verses 31 to 33. Uh, 6th of October last year, uh, a man decided to celebrate his birthday by walking up, trekking up Mount Blanc, uh, the highest peak in Western Europe. It's just under uh, 16,000 feet. Uh, he w- had to be rescued. And when they rescued him, he was in his walking boots and his tracksuit bottoms and a T-shirt. And so the headline was, Badly Prepared Climber Rescued Seconds from Death. Uh, The story, as always, was a bit more complex than that. He had gone on uh, the mountain fully kitted up, but in the the crisis that he met, he shed a lot of his kit, built a hole in the the snow and hid and waited uh, for rescue. But it started uh, a number of articles, uh, certainly where, where I was, so we could... Uh, follow the, uh, the response of the locals uh, who lived in the area at the foothill uh, of uh, Mount Blanc. Uh, one French mayor um, was distraught that um, climber after climber would leave his town and go up the mountain utterly ill-prepared, uh, to the point where he wanted every climber to have uh, death insurance so that if something happened on the mountain, that his town and the rescue team linked to his town wouldn't carry the cost of every single rescue. He was distraught because people were going up without the right kit, without the right experience, without the right company. They wouldn't book their places in the refuge huts on the way up or the way down. And he was appealing for people to go on this hazardous journey fully prepared. Matthew 13 is the command of the king telling his people how to go on the journey of following him fully prepared. Uh, There's a a book written uh, for counseling married couples uh, by a man called Paul Tripp. And the book is called, What Did You Expect? It's a question he finds himself asking Christian couples often when they come to him and say, this marriage lark is really hard work. And he would say, what did you expect? You're a sinner. You've married a sinner. What did you expect? Jesus wants his followers to be equipped because they're expecting the right thing. Does that make sense? Our expectations will help us prepare for what's to come. Jesus has taught them that one of the things they'll experience as followers of him in the world is a varied response. There's a, 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 um, a seed that goes into the ground, four kinds of soil, four kinds of harvest. We will, Jesus is teaching his followers, we will receive different kinds of responses to the message of the kingdom. Jesus experienced them. His disciples will experience them. You experience them as Christians as you try and share your faith. You, you get different responses. He wanted his disciples to be ready for that so they wouldn't be knocked off course the first time somebody said no or the first time someone who showed such promise uh, withered or was choked. Uh, he, he wants them to be ready as well for this, the reality of the spiritual opposition they'll face. So the parable is the, the parable of the, the weeds and the wheat. The farmer uh, sets out his his land, plants good seed in good soil, but an enemy comes and plants weeds as well. And so the two grow together, the wheat and the weeds. And it's at the end of the harvest that they'll be divided out. The reality of spiritual opposition. It's not just a material world uh, we live in. And then he, he talks to them in verses 31 to 33. He talks to them about their expectations about the speed of the coming of the kingdom. And he says on the screen, there's some points for us to follow. You may find them helpful, you may not. If they're not helpful, don't follow them. Um, uh, He's coming. He's coming. Uh, The king will one day come. 
uh, there's going to be a culmination, a consummation, if the theologians call it, a consummation of the new creation, new heavens and new earth, where Christ will come in person and in power and set in place the completion of the new creation from which eternal joy and gladness will be our portion. He is coming. Brilliant. When? Acts chapter 1, verse 6. Jesus has died, risen again, spent time with the disciples, and, and so they ask this question. Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Is it now? Is it going to happen now? Will your kingship be established and, and all our enemies be conquered? Is heaven coming now? Very interesting. Soon after that conversation, the Holy Spirit comes upon them and they never ask that question again. They, they never ask Jesus then to come. And they're prompted by the Spirit to long for Christ's coming, but that sort of come now goes because I suggest to you the long view that Jesus gives them in Matthew 13 is given to them by the Spirit on Pentecost. What Jesus is doing when he tells them that there is a, there is a, a coming, a, a completion to the kingdom, if you like, the fully grown tree or the fully prepared bread, fully baked, things will be finished, but not yet. Imagine, uh, for some of us we'll have to imagine hard, but imagine, you're standing, uh, you're standing on an on a athletics track, and it's as short as it can be. It's 60 meters. So that's the shortest track you can find. It's the, the indoor track. Imagine you're getting ready to start this 60 meter run. Normally, let's be gracious, normally it happens under 10 seconds, okay? All right. But then imagine the finish line that you can see gets stretched and stretched and stretched and stretch, and it keeps going to the point where it's out of sight. But you're told this event is now, what's well, a marathon now? Hey, how far is a marathon? Anybody know? 26 miles, 385 yards, give or take. There's quite a difference, isn't there? 60 meters, 26 miles. What Jesus is doing here to that desire for the, the end, the coming of Christ in power and person, he's stretching their horizon out. He is coming, this king, and he's coming again. The kingdom will come to an end. Uh, the kingdom on earth will come to an end with the, the new heavens and new earth. But he's not coming yet. You have to be patient. The whole of Matthew 13 stretches this long view out. So the, the parable of the, 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 the seed in the soil, um, we will only know the true harvest after a period of time. Uh, some plants will come up, but wither. And it's only in time will we see the genuine harvest. It's only at the end will the wheat and the weeds be harvested and separated. Only at the end, he's telling them. It's only after uh, this, this smallest of seeds. There's a brilliant picture that Richard chose, uh, 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 Robbie sorry, choose, has chosen for a tiny seed. You could fit maybe 10 of them on the, the tip of your, your little finger. Tiny seed. <coughs> will grow out to be the largest of the garden plants. Probably the length of this pulpit. Probably the height to which I'm reaching now. That's the kind of height of the, the garden plant. From this tiny little thing. It will grow to fruition, but it's going to take time. And so he's stretching out their view. Their desire for the, the kingdom to come. Yes, but not yet. Uh, we see it again. 
towards the end, he talks about the parable of the, the dragnet, it's called, or the parable of the nets, where, where the, the fishermen go and cast out the net, and they get good fish and bad fish, and they separate them. But it's at the end. It's at the end of time that that happens. And so he's asking them uh, to wait. He is coming again, uh, but not yet. Our desire for a quick fix or a quick resolution is understandable. He's not, uh, Christ wasn't rebuking his disciples. He was equipping them. Christian, there will be a time when the Christ will come in power and in person and he will bring the struggles of this life to an end. And he'll bring the start of eternal joy and gladness. He'll bring that. But generations of Christians have read these parables and have understood, but not yet. We will have to wait. But as we wait, uh, we see this. Not just a contrast, the tiny little seed to the massive plant. Uh, not just the, the little bit of uh, leaven that goes in and uh, the fully finished bread that's resulted. Uh, not only the contrast between those two things, but also there's a connection. And this is for our encouragement. Uh, to, in picture terms, there's a mustard seed that's gone into the ground and a mustard tree will be the fruit. Uh, what Christ has started in the kingdom of God, he will bring it to a completion but between starting and finishing, there is a genuine work being done by God present day for the disciples and for us present day that he will bring uh, to fulfillment. Sometimes as we look forward to the return of Jesus Christ and him coming to bring the new creation, uh, we think it'll be so altogether different that this life has no significance, but that's not true. This life, albeit slowly and in smallness, this life is significant. The kingdom of God has come and will come, but it continues to grow over time, which means that your every day of every single Christian has a if you like, a, a divine dignity given to it. How you are with every situation you meet matters to God. If you like, we are investing our treasures to come. Uh, in our house, we're fans of the, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Some of you are, some of you aren't. I don't really care. <coughs> but let me just give you this illustration. Uh, there's a, a, series, a, a series called Mandalorian. And at the end, the end credits of each episode, uh, you see these wonderfully artistic pencil drawings, or at least they look like pencil drawings. And they're, they're really impressive. And what they are is early scenes from the storybook. Uh, some artists have sat down and thought of the story, and the artist has put the, the story uh, of the mind onto paper and said, this scene could look like this, and this scene could look like this, and this character can look like this, and, and this ship can look like that, etc. And as you, you watch the episode and you get to the end and the end credits roll, it doesn't quite look like that. They've changed some of the characters. They've changed some of the ships. They've changed some of the things. But you can see where it comes from. There's continuity between what was drawn in the early stages and what was produced in, in, at the last. And that's the same for the kingdom of God. There's continuity. Uh, the values that are instilled in us by God's Spirit here and now the worship of Jesus Christ, the adoration of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the, the, the characteristic, characteristics that are worked into us by the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, those things will all be perfected. There's a continuity. And so if you like, the, the early stages of the kingdom of God are the, are the pencil drawings, if I can put it like that. And the new creation to come is the full color 
finished production. We are connected, in other words, today to that great day. Why do I say that? I say that because sometimes, not always, sometimes we can become downhearted with the difficulty of life. It's challenging. The sin within is bad enough, let alone the spiritual opposition, let alone the world that is against the Bible, let alone sometimes the relationship struggles I have with people even in church. It's hard, and we can lose heart. We're not going to give up, no, but we can have the wind knocked out of us sometimes. But he is coming. And there is work being done by God's Spirit in us and through us that is of the same stuff as what will be finished perfectly one day. And so we are to persevere gladly, honestly before God, knowing that he will bring it to fruition. And as we do that, uh, we, we see, let me take it to verse 33, we see that we're commissioned for influence, uh, we started the series on Daniel this morning. A brilliant introduction to this subject. Daniel and his three friends were transported, as we heard this morning, to Babylon. How are they going to cope? How are they going to get on there? Well, they're going to serve God wherever they find themselves. That's what Matt was teaching us this morning. Wherever they are, whatever they can legitimately do, they will serve God. Uh, Daniel and his three friends were, were, were taking the instruction that was given by Jeremiah uh, to, pursue the seek, uh, to pursue the peace of the city. Even though it's a pagan city, even though it's a, a, a godless city, they were to seek the peace of that city. And here we see in this picture, verse 33, of the, the leaven or the yeast being hidden inside uh, the dough. What do you do once you've worked the yeast in, you, you leave it to, you leave it to prove, don't you? you? You allow it to take its effect, and then you pop it in the oven, uh, just in case you're curious. Uh, the amounts uh, being recorded for us are um, the most that one woman can cook in an oven in one day. Somebody told me, some bloke told me that. There you go. That's the idea. So it's a, it's a hard day's work, uh, but. But this, this idea of a small bit, just a tiny bit of yeast going in and working its way through uh, the bread. And so the kingdom of God is like that. God has his people until he comes again. And as he can, carries on the increasing nature of his kingdom, uh, God's people are an influence where they are, sometimes imperceptible. You can't see yeast working quickly but you can't see it working because when you go back to check, it's starting to grow. So it can be seen, but it's just not, well, impressive. Have you ever looked at the Christian church and thought, <coughs> that is far from impressive? Have you ever looked around at this local church and thought to yourself, my goodness me, this is it? This is God's kingdom on earth? Have you ever looked in the mirror and thought, oh dear, I'm God's representative in my family. We can be downhearted at the smallness of things, at the seeming insignificance of things, at the, at times, deeply unimpressive nature of things. God knows that. Christ knows that. But he's talking, he's talking to 12 men at this point. And his global strategy is being shared with 12 blokes who you would not choose to be your mates. And he's telling them this is going to work. Slowly, patiently. This is going to go and grow and spread. And people will hear. So whenever, if ever, you are tempted to lose heart when you look in the mirror or look around or you hear of the weakness of the church, and you're tempted to think, what hope have we got? 
Can I suggest you come back to this tiny little parable about a tiny little bit of yeast that goes in, and it will have effects. Bread will be produced. What's designed for it will happen. We're commissioned uh, for influence. So don't give up parents and grandparents. Keep praying for your children and grandchildren. Keep talking to them if you can. Freely about Jesus. Keep buying them books that they'll read stories from the Bible. Keep going with that. It might look deeply insignificant, but such is the kingdom of God. Small things happening over a long time. Sunday school teachers, uh, junior fellowship leaders, uh, those who serve in the community outreach events uh, in the church here, sometimes you can go home at the end of a session and think, why, why do I bother? What was all that about? Nobody was listening. And all it is is hard work. Sometimes, such is the kingdom of God. Serving him like that can often be small, seemingly insignificant. But God does work through that kind of means. Sometimes we'd love the big and successful. Sometimes we'd love dozens of people to come to faith every week. But the kingdom of God, Jesus has said, starts small and grows small. And sometimes doesn't look like it's growing very much at all. But he will see to it that it will accomplish his work. Do you see the difference that makes to us? If I have that picture in my head, I will, when I lose heart, it'll pick me back up again. And I'm, I'll be less tempted to lose heart as quick. Because he knows what he's doing with the small, with the seemingly insignificant. Uh, let me just put these last two points on. We're to have a confidence in this, okay? We're to have a confidence that this God who sees his, uh, who, he lays out this design for the growth of his kingdom, we have a confidence that he knows what he's doing. Let me tell you some things that might just help. We see this very pattern of the, the small growing in time uh, to the large and, and effective. We see it in Jesus Christ, don't we? The eternal son of the eternal God limits himself for a season to the womb of a mother. When he's born, he limits himself to the boundaries of a human body. You know what that's like. That doesn't look very impressive for the eternal son of the eternal God who created just by speaking, does it? Just one human body. And then he chooses to live in Nazareth. And when he rides into Jerusalem, he's on a donkey, not a horse. And then in a matter of days, he's hanging on a cross, and then he's occupying a tomb. That, none of that looks impressive. But here's the paradox. To the Christian, that is glorious, isn't it? The fact that he would come and enflesh himself so that one day he could die for sinners, unoccupy the tomb, and reign supreme. It's a glorious story, but when you look at it first, it's easily scorned, isn't it? Such is the pattern of the kingdom of God. People will look at you, look at the church, look at the gospel, read God's word and think, no. And yet, others will look at you, look at the church, look at the gospel, read the Bible and go, yes. This is what I need. This is what I want. This is it. I'm going to trust myself to Jesus Christ. So we see the pattern uh, in Jesus Christ. We see it in the, in, the, in, the, in the very early church. Just You may need to turn the page. Just have a look at the last part of chapter 13. 
last part of chapter 13. So he's preparing them for a small start, a slow progress of the kingdom of God. What happens And from verse 53 on? He goes to Nazareth. He goes home. And there they start to listen to him, and they say words like this. Where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? We know who he is. He works down the road. His mother's Mary, his brothers James and Joseph, Simon and Judas. The sisters are with us as well. Where then did this man get all these things? Here's the thing. They took offense at him. Here he is, the greatest teacher who ever lived, the greatest man who ever walked. They look at him, they recognize him, and they dismiss him. It doesn't make sense, does it? What happens in chapter 14? We read that John the Baptist, the greatest messenger of the kingdom of God before Christ, he's beheaded. Well, if you're going to go for a global strategy, Jesus being rejected in his hometown and the greatest messenger ever being beheaded, neither of those things are a good start, are they? Such is the kingdom of God. Some of the disciples when they become apostles filled with the Holy Spirit, we don't hear their names very often, some of them. Some of them just disappear. Unnamed heroes of the faith. But we'll have a confidence that this is the way uh, that God works. There's a lovely phrase in Hebrews 11. Let me just stay on this point a little bit. Hebrews 11 is the, um, the great cloud of witnesses chapter where characters from the Old Testament are named, and the fact that they waited but never saw in fullness what they waited for, that's recorded for us. They lived in hope. There are a great cloud of witnesses that are there for. But then towards the end of that, there's a record of men and women, unnamed and elsewhere in history, never written about. Here's the phrase, of whom this world was unworthy. You see that? God saw them and delighted in them. The world saw them and despised them. Some of them lived in caves. Some of them feared for their lives. Some of them faced persecution all their days. This world was not worthy, but such is the kingdom of God, where his people are called to that long view, knowing that he's coming not seeing it necessarily in their day, but they still are strengthened to persevere, like Daniel and his three friends. We're to have confidence in this. Even, Revelation 2, even when God's instruction, God's plan for his church, he says to the church in Smyrna, be faithful unto death would have confidence, such is the kingdom of God. He knows what he's doing with his people. And this is a comfort for us. This comfort is important because in the parable of the soil, the four kinds of soil, there's a certain kind of response, which is the shallow soil above rock, where the plant sprouts, but the the scorching heat of persecution and trouble withers the plant. If you don't know that the king is coming, you won't keep going. If you don't know that the king is coming but not yet, you won't keep coming when trouble hits. If you don't know that until the king comes, things may seem very small, seemingly unimpressive, you won't keep going because when trouble hits, you'll pack, you'll pack it in. But if you know that he's coming, and, and the weight is worth it, and the way he's designed to work in his kingdom, albeit small and seemingly unimpressive, that this is his design, then you're, you're equipped for the journey. Christian. And that equipment will stop you from withering in the heat of persecution and trouble. It will save us from false expectations that the Christian life is one big picnic. 
we'll be rescued from that. And we'll understand that the Christian life is a long journey, longing, waiting for the coming of the King, but it may not be yet, but it will be worth it. A friend of mine was taking part in the 100 meters sprint. It was a a county trials. He's a rugby player. He had never really been on an athletics track before, but he was very quick. And so in his heat, he ran and he was winning. And he came across a line on the track. It wasn't the finish line. But he came across this line, which was the countdown to the finish line. He thought he had finished. So as he hit the first line, he started to slow down. In the space of the next 15 yards, he came last. What, what were you doing? The PE teacher asked. I thought I'd finished, he said. You idiot, the PE teacher said. That's a polite ver- version of idiot, where I come from. He just wasn't ready to go all the way. The PE teacher had never told him where the finish line was. Christian, Jesus Christ wants his people to be ready, equipped for the journey, sobered, yes, and hopeful, because he will come, and the kingdom will spread, and it will one day reach utter perfection, and it will be worth it. So through all the bumps and bruises, keep going. Through the long journey and the long waiting, keep going. Through the seemingly insignificant moments of Christian faith and service, keep going. There are pictures of Daniel in the lion's den. It's funny, we can think, as Matt said, Daniel, when he was brought to Babylon, was about 14. By the time he got to the lion's den, he was probably about 80. He kept going beyond the lion's den. He kept going. Is he not an example to us that we would keep going for our joy and God's glory? Let's pray. Father in heaven, sometimes we, we really desire to be lifted up in our spirits and buoyed along for the week ahead. But yet there are moments in your words where you sober us, that you may sweeten us. Where you show us just how hard it will be so that we will depend upon you for everything. Lord, we are glad that everything is in your hand. And that every part of all of our days is in your sight and in your heart. Thank you, we can trust you with everything. Forgive us when we've looked upon the future with pride or selfishness or desiring comfort above all else. Lord, we confess that at times we get it wrong, so we're glad to get this correction and this encouragement. I pray you would instill into us the joyful prospect of the return of Jesus Christ. And until that day, please keep us faithful to you, we ask. Amen. Uh, We're going to sing uh, together. Um, The hymns will come on the screen. When I fear, my faith will fail. Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, he will hold me fast. It's a lovely declaration of dependence and delighting in God's sufficiency for every single day. Let's stand and sing.
Now go in the knowledge that justice has been satisfied, that Christian, you will be raised with Christ to endless life, and that one day our faith will be turned to sight. And until then, he will hold us fast. Amen.